Some of that economic data this morning looking ugly. Good morning, good morning. Equity futures are lower. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, we begin with the big issue, 50% out of a bear market hole. The market is a little optimistic. But it is starting to feel like those June lows might hold. The case for additional Fed tightening is rapidly dissipating. And stocks are rallying on that. The market is not listening to the central banks. They're choosing not to listen. Markets are completely ignoring Fed speakers. They're not really hearing the message. La, 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 la. There's a disconnect between some of the kind of Optimism that a little bit less inflation means we'll get less from the Fed. The market might be getting a little ahead of itself. A Fed that's looking at high inflation anyway. One month does not make a trend. Risk assets are still quite at risk for a hard landing. This market confronting a wall of doubt. Joining us right now is Crossmark's Victoria Fernandez, Aberdeen's James Athey. Victoria, let's go through the numbers. Four weeks of gains on the S&P, about 17% off the lows on the S&P 500. We've taken back 50% of the drawdown from the year so far. You don't trust this rally, do you? No, I really don't, Jonathan. I think a lot of what we've seen over the last month has really been due to the fact that yields have come down. And if we look over the last week, obviously that story of peak inflation has really been driving the market. And, and there's things that are happening because of that, right? Equity flows um, have been really strong. You're looking at like 11 billion last week. We're seeing short coverings in the market. If those things persist, then you're going to continue to have some support for the equity market. But look, if we if we break down those CPI numbers, and the PPI numbers, really most of that decline was due to oil and gas, but there's still that stickier component of inflation. There's rents, there's wages. We look at that cost push inflation component from the labor market and financial conditions are actually easier now than they were back in March. So in our opinion, the Fed is not going to take its foot off the gas at this point in time. And we think we're going to continue to have a choppy market going forward. We don't see ourselves out of the woods yet. Equities are down this morning by seven tenths of one percent. I've talked about that pushback. Lisa Shallot over at Morgan Stanley saying get real. Mike Wilson saying this. The equity market has front run a durable Fed pause. The odds of which are low to begin with. This leaves valuation significantly disconnected from economic earnings reality. Risk reward remains unattractive. James Athey, you're just straight up saying equities are a sell. Walk me through it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Victoria's covered a lot of the reasons there, and Mike's Mike's added the final the final kind of nail in the coffin, if you like. Um, first thing I'd say is that what we're observing really, I think, is just demonstrative of a of a financial market structure which has been inherently broken for a long time uh, and has essentially been um, not designed, but has emerged in a state which is, is designed to profit from the, the prior paradigm and designed to really be overtly sensitive to Fed policy. And therefore, uh, things like fundamentals and actually the earnings potential of individual companies get thrown out of the window. And, and all we do is really care about uh, whether the Fed sounds more hawkish or, or more dovish than they did yesterday. <clears throat> the reality is the equity market never repriced for anything like a growth slowdown, let alone a recession. All it did was take out the valuation froth which had emerged in, during the pandemic when everybody was extrapolating unsustainable trends long into the future uh, and deciding that regardless uh, of the future economic reality, it was OK to pay any price for equities because bond yields were low. All of that is not particularly useful analysis. And I fear that when the economy has a cold shower, the equity market is going to experience one also. Easy for me to join the bear market party with you two this morning. I'll just take the other side just for a moment. Payrolls were great. Massive upside surprise. Downside surprise on inflation. Those two things together. Good news is good news. Victoria, I sense your pushback around this idea that there are people, market participants, saying peak inflation, that means peak Fed hawkishness. Is that the wrong way of looking at it? Yeah, I think it's the wrong way for sure. I mean, we talk about the Fed's looking at that month over month number. So we have one month 
where CPI didn't go higher. It stayed flat. And then we have PPI, again, like we said a moment ago, driven more by the commodity component and the oil and the gas component. But remember, you know, we have to tell the story the same way on both sides. So when oil prices were going up and gas prices were going up, we said, oh my goodness, that's going to hurt the consumer. Demand is going to go down. So if that's the story then, as these prices come down, that should actually increase demand from consumers and strengthen that component, which for inflation is not really what the Fed wants to see at this point in time. So I, I really do push back on that idea. Yes, good news is good news, but it's not great news. And I think we're getting a little over our skis when the market thinks what we're in the clear, when there's definitely a lot of concerns still left that we need to tackle. A quote of the week on Bloomberg surveillance over the last week. What's the difference between a bear market rally and something more durable? And someone just turned around and said, hindsight, we need to do better than that. B. Riley's Art Hogan said this, a perfect 50% retracement from the peak to trough in this cycle that tends to delineate the difference between a bear market rally and the start of a bull run. And that's going to get a lot more believers into this market. Taylor Riggs has more. Hey, Taylor. John, so you're right. From a technical level, we've certainly come a long ways. When you take a look at the terminal chart and you see recovering about half those losses, but again, nowhere near sort of the record highs that we had really to start the year. I do hear maybe not some of these technicals, but there is a little bit of some of the short covering around the 4,200. Next stop, maybe about 44. So certainly keeping the technicals in mind as we continue to talk about the fundamentals, as we always do. Let's talk about the fundamentals. Five out of the 11 sectors are what is leading this rally. 79% of the gains are coming from these sectors alone. We've talked about technology being the big winner, up more than 20% off of those June lows. Discretionary as well, so that feels risk on. Financial is interesting, given we've talked a lot about at least the two tens and that portion of the yield curve continuing to be inverted and increasing sometimes in magnitude and duration. But if there is sort of another bullish theme, it is a VIX. And we've talked a lot about, is this still the right indicator to be looking at? It is below 20. It was until today. We take up a little bit to about a 21, but still really relatively low when you think about the bullishness and maybe the lack of fear that this index represents. Taylor Riggs, awesome to have you with us. Taylor's going to be with us around the opening bell. Going into that opening bell, we are about 25 minutes away. Futures are negative. Not everyone is bearish and pushing back against this rally that we've seen. I talked about BNP Paribas a couple of weeks ago. It talked about the risk of crowding it as this market climbs higher. Arguably, to some degree, we've seen some of that. Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo on this program too two weeks ago. He said the weakness you're looking for in this U.S. economy isn't going to come soon. You've got to wait until the first half of 2023. James Athey, allow me to pick up on that point from Chris Harvey over at Wells Fargo. Do you think he's going to be wrong? He's saying you're too early. The weakness in this economy and earnings is not going to show up until the first half of 23. Do you disagree? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, you have to define, don't you? I think a lot of people see this as binary recession, yes or no. And, and you know, if we're not in recession, we act as if we're in a booming economy. I'm, I'm going to be a little bit, bit more subtle than that and suggest we're on a path and the path is down and the path has been down for quite some time. It's been down from a, an above trend, a, a completely unsustainable position given the, um, you know, unsustainable monetary and fiscal support which got us there. And we've seen some of that froth come out. But what we're seeing now is that policy is, is continuing to tighten. We're seeing certain sectors of the economy really struggling. We're seeing consumer incomes really hurt. And in an economy which is 80 percent consumption, that's a pretty big headwind. This is going to be a process. It's not a binary event. But if you look at the trend in key you know, data, with the exception of payrolls, which really is the last man standing and is a lagging indicator, everything is telling you that the path is downwards. And therefore, I think earnings will remain under pressure because it's going to be very difficult to protect margins um, when the starting point was elevated margins. And of course, when it's very much a cost input cost shock, which is, which is hitting the economy today. So uh, yes, I think the economy will be weaker in Q123 than it is now, but I don't think that means it's going to be strong between now and then. James, you used the phrase there, policy is tighter, but financial conditions are easier. What wins out here? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a seller of the idea that financial conditions really are the metric that we should be using. Part of the problem is that there's a circularity there, and that's exactly where the Fed has found itself trapped between their desire to communicate policy changes in advance and their inability to forecast really the key economic metrics and the fact that markets are desperately uh, hoping to be risk on and forward looking, you just get trapped there. I think what matters realistically is that we have a heck of a lot of debt 
we have a huge, huge, huge cohort within most Western populations who had very, very low disposable income to begin with and are seeing that being massively eroded by this um, non-discretionary uh, cost shock that we're seeing. Um, these are the significant headwinds that you have anyway. And then when you put fiscal policy from as loose as it's ever been to uh, tightening at the margin and indeed monetary policy moving quite rapidly through the gears in a way that we haven't seen for 40 years, some pretty significant headwinds out there. Some pretty significant moves happening this morning. We've got the S&P down to six tenths. No real drama considering some of the moves we've seen this year. But look at commodities down about 5% on WTI to 87 on Brent to 93 on Copper, down about 2.6%. The data out of China, I'll touch on that in a moment, bad. Victoria, the data out of the US. Seems to me the narrative is switching from data point to data point. It was Empire Manufacturing this morning. Sam Rowe, and on Twitter this morning, said, you don't often see the word plummeted used in official reports. And that's the word the New York Fed uses this morning. The headline general business conditions index plummeted 42 points. Now, Victoria, can I ask you what data are you focused on right now? Because one minute the ISM looks decent, the next minute the regional Fed indices, the indexes look terrible. That's exactly right, which is why we think there's going to be so much volatility for the rest of the year. I know James was saying he doesn't expect the market to be solid from now to the end of the year, and we agree. We think there's going to be that give and take for exactly that reason. So, I mean, what do we look at? You have to look at everything and try to weigh it against each other. So, obviously, labor market is extremely important. Manufacturing is important. The consumer and the corporate balance sheets and the strength of those two segments has really been driving the market. So, we've been watching to see when do we get a change in those two items? We haven't seen it tremendously yet. You know, you look at earnings going into the third and the fourth quarter, and we're seeing earning estimates come down. But yet at the same time, the momentum is pretty strong. Taylor was talking about some of those technicals. We're looking at how many stocks are making 20-day highs, how many are trading above their 20-day uh, moving average. Those numbers are moving higher, which tells you you know, that maybe this rally has a little bit of legs to it. But at the same time, you've got weekly jobless claims moving higher. You have trouble going on in Europe. You have the China data that you mentioned. Yeah. So all of that tells us it's give and take, Jonathan, and you have to just kind of step back and take a broader view. Victoria, James, sticking with us. Futures down six tenths of one percent. Let's get you some movers gun into the open and bow. Here's Abby. John, well, sticking with that disappointing China data, we here in the U.S., of course, woke up to the surprise rate hike cut, excuse me, hike by cut, excuse me, by the PBOC, uh, of course, going against the other central banks. And this is weighing in a big time on the commodity complex, as you were talking about, and also on, not surprisingly, energy and natural resource movers here in the U.S. ExxonMobil down 3.7 percent in line uh, or weighed on by oil. Halliburton down 4 percent. Freeport, McMoran, one of the big copper miners, down 4.5 percent. And then, of course, uh, Rio Tinto, which is also another miner, uh, down 3.8 percent. If we were to take a look at some of those China Tech ADRs, John, not surprisingly, we would see uh, big declines there, too. That's weighing on the tech sector here in the U.S. overall. And not pretty at all. Abby, thank you. Coming up on this program, some ugly data out of China. Pick your exposure to China very carefully. Uh, we like China Tech uh, for the long term and brave at heart. Uh, but China's that economy is slowing down greatly. The latest on China at home and abroad on the mainland and in Taiwan. We'll catch up with Mike McKee and AMH on the other side. This is Bloomberg. of data are not exactly very pretty. The expectations are very high for that quick recovery that we're used to seeing in China, but that might not come as quickly as in previous uh, cycles. Policymakers are concerned and they want to make a gesture. Ten basis points, it's a small gesture, but at least uh, it shows that they care. It's really a signal of what's to come. We've had a huge amount of credit and fiscal impulse, but is that enough? That is really the question. China facing challenges at home and abroad. The latest economic data revealing a deepening slowdown. This is the country ramps up its military action near Taiwan following another U.S. visit. The Chinese foreign ministry saying the following. U.S. politicians who have been colluding with Taiwan independent separatist forces and attempting to challenge the one China principle, they are overestimating themselves. They are doomed to fail. Team coverage starts right now with Bloomberg's Anne-Marie down in D.C., Mike McKee here in New York. AMH is another visit and more tension. 
more tension and really because this highlights the fact that this visit led by Senator Ed Markey of Massachusetts is just less than two weeks since Speaker Pelosi went. Now, it's not uncommon for members of Congress to go to Taiwan to have these congressional visits, but it is unlikely that you would see the Speaker of the House go, which is why that has drawn a lot of condemnation from China. And we saw these live fire drills and also sending off ballistic missiles, which likely went over the island to land in Japan's economic exclusion zone. And the fact that this trip is so close together, it is just creating more tension between these two countries. And what you see now is China's defense military coming out with a statement that the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, is preparing for war. And they are continuing these live drills around the strait. The visits aren't new. AMH, we've talked about that. The reaction to it is. And there are many people out there drawing a line between the weakness in the domestic economy and this president, the leader of the Chinese Communist Party, President Xi, doubling down on tension abroad. Mike McKee, that data out of China overnight, not great. And I would say the data going into the weekend wasn't terrific either. Well, nobody was expecting it to be in the sense that you shut down your economy and you're going to lose some economic activity. But go back to the uh, board that shows what happened. It's way below what even was expected. Everybody had marked down their growth figures and that they still came in worse than thought. And here's the worst part for President Xi. Youth unemployment, 18 to 25 years old, is skyrocketing there. And that is not something you want to have in a country that prizes social calm. The, uh, the idea of uh, President okay. Xi trying to get another term under these circumstances would ordinarily, in most countries, I would say, would be difficult. But right now, it is something that he has to deal with. Uh, the Bank of China did cut interest rates today, but only by 10 basis points. That's not expected to have a major impact on how the economy responds because the cut was so small, and analysts are expecting more to come in the future. Any other country might we'd be talking about trouble at the polls, but that doesn't happen in a dictatorship. At least that's not what he has to face. Mike McKee, thank you. We'll catch up with you later in the hour on the week ahead. And to you, AMH, as well, the tension in D.C., we've got to pick up on that in about 30 minutes from now. Victoria, the dynamics that we look at in the Chinese economy, as Mike described it, if you put the data together right now, the credit data on Friday was not great. It was weak. The data overnight, terrible. That rate cut, is that going to make a difference if we're facing what a lot of people think we are facing, which is some form of balance sheet recession in that economy? I don't think it's going to make a huge difference. I mean, look, this rate cut was for, they did 10 basis points for the short-term facility, 10 basis points on the medium term. But what they're really trying to do is fix the loan growth. That's where the issue is so much and what they're so concerned about. Obviously, a lot of that is tied to the property sector. You guys talked about a little bit on surveillance this morning on how much they're struggling within the property sector while still trying to deleverage over the last couple of years. And it's a battle that they're trying to figure out how to win. They're hoping banks lower that prime rate, that that will help loan growth. But for right now, with the unemployment moving higher in that lower demographic or uh, younger age demographic, with the property sector struggling and with the shutdowns just now ending, I think we're in for some more negative news coming out of China and how that relates to supply chains and issues flowing through to the U.S. and demand for U.S. Um, from U.S. consumers for demand for Chinese goods. I think we're in for, um, again, some, some volatility here in regards to these numbers. Victoria, what do you think the pass-through looks like? Typically, we talk about China exporting disinflation. It's been exporting inflation because of the supply chain problems of the last couple of years. What does the pass-over, the pass-through look like from this weakness we're seeing play out in that economy? Yeah, you know, I'm actually a little bit more concerned with the pass through or the passover that we're going to see coming out of Europe. Um, in regards to this, I think that's where we're going to see recession probably raise its head first, especially in regards to the oil situations and natural gas that we're seeing there. You couple that with Europe being one of the largest uh, buyers of Chinese goods and the concern there, then I think coupled together, that's going to be some concern. It's why I actually agree with the idea that early 2023 is when the U.S. might start to see some severe issues in regards to leading to recession, not necessarily the rest of this year. But looking into next year, that's where we'll see some problems. Well, in Europe, rates are going up. In China, James Athey, they're going down. I asked this question this morning, James. I'll ask it of you. Are they confronting a liquidity trap in the Chinese economy? It's interesting, right, the terms you use in there, John, liquidity trap, balance sheet recession. This is very reminiscent. I mean, if uh, 
if, if you've ever followed Richard Koo, you'll, you'll know his work well on, on what happened to Japan and, and the difficulties with stimulating when you are in a balance sheet recession. Ultimately, the short answer to that is that it doesn't matter how much you cut rates. It's not the price of money, which is the problem. It is the demand for loan for other reasons, not least that you have balance sheets which need repairing, which is a problem which is not resolved easily by low interest rates. In Japan's case, it was offset, though not resolved by a lot of fiscal stimulus. And that's why we've seen debt to GDP there all the way up to the sort of 250, 300% that we see before us today. I don't think China wants to make that mistake. That's everything that they're telling is they understand the challenge and they don't want to make, make the mistake of heavily relying on monetary policy to try and deal with a problem which doesn't really have its roots in monetary policy. Ultimately, China has structural challenges. These were inevitable. And you cannot solve structural challenges with cyclical policy. And I don't think they want to. I think first and foremost, as you've, you've already described, though, the priorities here are political in nature. President Xi needs to get through the Congress, consolidate his power, and then and only then really may he feel emboldened to try and take on these challenges because they are difficult to deal with. Ultimately, the big one is the savings rate. China needs to get its consumers to spend more and save less. And nothing which has been on the table from Chinese policymakers even really acknowledges that problem, let alone uh, proffers a solution to deal with it. And we've been talking about that transition to consumption domestically for a long, long time now. James Athey, awesome to catch up, buddy, as always. Victoria Fernandez there on the latest as well. We'll continue this conversation off the back of the is it a bear market rally, isn't it a bear market rally debate of the last month or so. Futures right now, negative six tenths of one percent. Coming up the morning calls and later, Bank of America pushing back against the rally, seeing further downside. That conversation just around the corner with Jill Kerry Hall. Looking forward to that from New York this Monday morning. Good morning to you all. This is Bloomberg. Five minutes away from the opening bow this morning. Good morning. Empire Manufacturing from the New York Fed. Brutal. Really, really bad. Severe drop off. And equities drop in two down. Six tenths of one percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq down about a third of one percent or so. The bigger reaction off the back of that data point was in the bond market. Yields heading south. Two tenths and thirties looked like this. Your ten year down by five or six basis points. The two year down by five. Your two year right now just south of 320. That's the price action. Here's some morning calls for you. First up, Citigroup reiterating its bearish view on Cisco, expecting shares to remain under pressure amid continuing supply chain disruptions. That stock is down by around about seven tenths of one percent. Your second call from Argus downgrading Southwest Airlines to a hold, seeing limited upside until inflationary pressures begin to stabilize. We're down there by about eight tenths to 39.14. And finally, BMO downgrading Dollar General to market perform, recommending investors wait for a better entry point. We're down there negative 1.2 percent on Dollar General. That stock 250 in the pre-market. Coming up, Wall Street taking sides after the longest weekly winning streak of the year so far. Bank of America looking to fade the rally. We'll catch up with Jill Carey Hall of Bank of America next with futures down six tenths of one percent from New York. This is Bloomberg. Four seconds away from the opening bell in New York this Monday morning. Good morning. Four weeks of gains on the S&P. Longest weekly winning streak of the year so far on the S&P 500. A rally of close to 17 percent off the lows of 2022. Futures this morning negative by about five or six tenths of one percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq down about a third of one percent. We'll talk about the small caps a little bit later this morning. The Russell down by eight tenths of one percent. That was your opening bell. Switch on the board and get to the bond market. Off the back of pretty dreadful data out of China. Throw in pretty ugly data out of New York. The Empire Manufacturing Read. Negative. Yields are negative two, down six basis points on a 10 year to 277. Two year yields lower as well. Two's 10 still in pre and misra territory. Negative 40 basis points ish on a two's tens curve. In the FX market, dollar stronger, euro weaker, euro dollar just about holding on to 102 after breaking that level a little bit earlier this morning. And front and centre for me and many others too is just this weakness in the commodity market, crude down by more than 5% to $87 and around about 30 cents. That's the cross asset price action about 40 seconds into this one. Let's get you some movers. Here's Abby. John, well, with this modestly softer open here for US stocks, not surprisingly, we have a lot of laggards, especially in the natural resource and energy 
energy space. You were mentioning that weak data out of China and also the New York Fed. Well, Occidental Petroleum down 3.7 percent. This says crude, as you were just mentioning, down 5 percent. China, of course, the world's largest uh, user of natural resources. So that slowdown really weighing on some of these stocks here. Marathon oil also lower. Now, interestingly, we, of course, have yields in a bit. Uh, but Bank of America and the other banks down, too. Perhaps the idea, if the world's second largest economy is slowing down again, what does that mean for the U.S. and Europe? And then finally, Apple uh, off of its lows, down ever so slightly, looking like it may actually flip higher uh, not so long from now, John. Abby, thank you. About two minutes into this, super, super defensive. We're down four tenths of one percent on the S&P. Just look at the sector composition here. The outperformance coming from utilities, staples, healthcare, real estate. You might have guessed that. Given the move we're seeing in yields, financials underperformed down nine tenths of one percent. Really defensive, as I say. Materials, energy not performing. The route in crude, energy's down by about three point eight percent on the S and P five hundred. That's the broader equity market on the S and P. I want to talk about the Russell two thousand breaching its two hundred day moving average in the previous session. Ed Cliss sold of Ned Davis saying the following: Small caps tend to outperform in the early stages of a market. Market rally. It has room to outperform for at least the next several weeks. Taylor's back with us for more. Hey, Taylor. And John, I read that note coming out at the end of last week and really interesting. And indeed, up until today, you did have a Russell 2000, really a big outperformer. Let's talk about some of those key technical levels. Right now, we're just holding on to that 2000 on the Russell 2000. I have a 200 day moving average at 2011. So we touched that on Friday, just below it, but really right there on the line when you think about some of those key 200 day moving averages and the technicals and the strength that that provides. You talked a lot about that Ned Davis uh, note there, of course and really being a big outperformer at the beginning of these rallies. I want to talk about the dollar, John, because we've talked a lot about how dollar strength has been a big headwind for some of the big multinationals as they translate a lot of their overseas profits back into a dollar denominated balance sheet. The Russell 2000, you could argue, maybe doesn't have a lot of those headwinds as they're more maybe domestically focused, more U.S. focused. And so you don't have that translation adjustment on the balance sheet. Indeed, you have that big outperformance relative to the S&P 500 here as you think about maybe dollar being a tailwind instead of a headwind. Finally, take a look at um, some of the individual sectors, if you will. You've talked a lot about what has been driving this, uh, NASDAQ as well, if we want to talk about the yield story, but it really has been a Russell 2000 and technology. Do we call this a new bull market or do I get in trouble for saying that if we're off uh, more than 20 percent from some of those big lows? I think you can call it whatever you want to call it, Taylor. I'll give you a pass. <laughs> I'm still trying to work out. Is it a bear market rally? Is it a bull market? Mm -hmm. Something durable? Taylor, as I said earlier on the program, someone came up with the best response to that. The difference between the two, hindsight. And it's always the same thing. You always know a lot later on. Taylor, thank you. Breaking it down for us. Taylor Riggs there. We are about three or four minutes into this. And I have to say, beneath the headline, there's a lot going on. At the headline, at the surface, the S&P 500 not doing much at all. We're negative four tenths of one percent. The Nasdaq totally unchanged. The division on Wall Street's not going anywhere. You know the story. Morgan Stanley on the one side, JP Morgan on the other. Morgan Stanley disagreeing with everything, looking for weaker profits and rising rates to put stocks lower. JP Morgan saying, guess what, Katie Lyons, this can continue. Yeah, you can always count on these two to disagree with each other, John, if you can count on anything at all. And of course, what they're disagreeing on now is the trajectory of the equity market after the rally we have seen over the last four weeks, the longest weekly winning streak for the S&P 500 going back to November of 2021. That has brought the index up 17 percent since its low in mid-June. The Nasdaq 100 is up about 22 percent since that bottom. And J.P. Morgan says the show is going to go on. They see the gains continuing in the second half, primarily driven by rate sensitive growth stocks as bond yields have pulled back. And they say that any shift back into value stocks is likely going to wait until there's signs that the U.S. growth picture has bottomed out. So ultimately, they think the S&P is going to end the year at 4,800. And then there's the take from the bear, Mike Wilson, whose target is down at 3,900 for uh, June 2023. He says that this rebound is overdone. Stocks are going to slump into the second half because he says interest rates are going to keep rising. The economy is going to slow down and corporate profits are going to weaken. He has been talking about margins for some time now, and he says all of that adds up to a not favorable risk reward when it comes to equities. There's also one more factor to consider here, and that is a slowdown in buybacks. Goldman Sachs actually pointing out that although buyback uh, operations have jumped 18 percent so far this year to $856 billion, actual spending on stock repurchases sank 21 percent in the second quarter compared with the first. And of course, there's a new tax policy potentially that needs to fit into this equation as well. But that 
could be another hurdle for stocks as those with a bigger percentage buyout ratios have outperformed the benchmark S&P this year, John. Kelly, thank you. We're used to this story. Kelly's gone through it. Morgan Stanley on the one side, JP Morgan on the other. I think Bank of America is in Camp Morgan Stanley right now, just published moments ago. Here's the quote. A CPI miss, an average hourly earnings beat, plus weakening demand equals bad for corporates. Beneath the surface, real growth remains weak, and investors laser focus on the Fed combating inflation via short rates ignores the elephant in the room. I'm pleased to say that Jill Carey Hall joins us right now. Jill, you and the team, you're pushing back. Just walk me through the why. Well, I think, you know, what we've seen recently is we're, we're still seeing evidence of strong inflation. Um, you know, CPI was, was obviously, you know, coming down from the peak levels that we've seen recently, but eight and a half percent is still a strong number. Um, but and then you saw wages uh, come in better than expected, higher than expected. So, you know, we think this is a, a recipe for risk to margins for, for S&P 500 companies. Um, consensus analysts are looking for margins to return to, to peak levels next year. And, you know, they're, they're still looking for high single digit earnings growth this year and next. So, you know, we, we think the outlook in, in light of the macro conditions has has looked optimistic, particularly from a from a margin front. Um, and, and our economists do see risk that we we enter a mild recession. So, you know, we have had one of the, the lower S&P 500 targets, um, 3,600 for, for year end. Uh, we, we do expect that that earnings could actually decline next year if, if we do go into recession. So we think it's, you know, at this point is about opportunities within the market. You know, we're likely to see more volatility ahead um, and, and we would be selective within areas of the U.S. equity market. Jill, you know, the main event debate right now, the monster debate, is whether this is just a bear market rally or something more durable. You and Savita, the team, basically have this list of signposts that need to be triggered to signal the end of a bear market run. What are those signposts and how many of them have actually been triggered? And did this work back in spring 2020? That's right. We we look back historically at you know the 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 prior bear markets and then you know what usually happened before a new bull market occurred and you know bear market rallies are are pretty common. So seeing these you know five or even ten percent rallies up from the lows, but still within the context of a bear market, you know not reaching that twenty percent plus to get you into a new bull market. So you know we think there's there's risk that this is a, a bear market rally and that we're there still could be more downside risk to equity. You know, as, as mentioned, our, our target's 3,600. We, you know, when you look at all of these indicators, our, our sell side indicator, which is a measure of equity sentiment on Wall Street, um, that equity sentiment has been declining, but not yet giving us a, a buy signal. Um, when you look at the, what the Fed does, you know, typically the, the Fed starts to, to cut um, b before you, you enter that new bull market. So there's a number of signals that we've looked at, and typically altogether, um, about 80% of these signals that we found have been triggered, you know, prior to that that new bull market starting. Today we're only about thirty percent. So our view is that you know we're we're not in a new bull market yet. You're not alone. Lisa Shallot of Morgan Stanley is alongside you, saying basically the same things. Lisa Shallot said, "Get real." This was her quote: "Every bear market, we have these retracement rallies. They are head fake rallies. It's not enough for price earnings ratios to come in. Policy operates with a lag." She goes on to say, "And it has an impact. It slows the economy. And if the economy slows, corporate profits go down. We have not seen those earnings estimates come down yet, and that's really what we're waiting for." Now, Jill, what would you say to people say, that say that maybe some of this is just too early? That maybe the weakness doesn't really come until the front half of 2023, and this conversation is premature. Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo taking that view. What would you say back? Look, I mean, I think there's there's a lot of signals out there right now that we're watching. When you look at, we we have a regime indicator within the U.S. that monitors different macro signals, and that would suggest that we're still in a late cycle backdrop, and you know, not yet in that that recessionary territory. Um, you know, our economists do expect that that we're likely to enter recession, but but not necessarily in one yet. Um, but but given that the 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 wage and inflation data has remained strong, we we think that is a continued case for the Fed to, to continue hiking this year. Um, you know, we, we do expect, you know, two more 50 basis point hikes and then a, a 25 basis point hike before the Fed goes on pause and then ultimately starts cutting in the second half of, of 23. So, you know, look, I think there's the the, the bull cases that we, we see, uh, you know, continued late cycle, you know, soft landing. But, 
we're likely to see volatility from here. Um, you know, we, we do think there are opportunities right now, as I mentioned. So, you know, typically when volatility stays elevated, you want to own higher quality stocks, stocks with stable earnings. I think if we're in a backdrop of, you know, lower price returns or, or even negative price returns for U.S. equities, that's an environment where dividend yield matters more than ever, you know, total returns rather than, than price returns. Um, and, and we've been favorable on, you know, U.S. small caps over large caps, uh, even if if we we are in an environment where recession risk is high, we think that you know there are some fundamental tailwinds to small caps, and there are also you know at this point small caps are more adequately pricing in the risks of, of recession. And Jill, what are those fundamental tailwinds for small caps? The Russell's down about one percent today, but that's not indicative of how it's performed over the last few months at all. But Jill, just walk me through that. Sure. So I think you know we've we've generally seen over the past you know since March services spending has been holding up better than goods related spending. Um, small caps are much more exposed to the, the services side of the economy. We've also seen, you know, one of the takeaways from this earnings season is that, you know, even though overall corporate sentiment on, on earnings calls was rather negative, um, guidance has held up well across the board. So for both large caps and small caps, you've seen earnings guidance is kind of surprised to the upside. But one particularly positive thing for small caps is that CapEx spending has held up very well. Corporates are are still investing um, that and they've been guiding very positively on, on future capex and i think you know in tandem with that we we've seen you know, surging mentions of, of reshoring on, on earnings calls. So we think the, the reshoring of U.S. manufacturing is, a, is another key theme. A lot of companies are going to need to spend on, on CapEx. Um, and that's something that benefits small caps. Their sales are more highly correlated to, to U.S. CapEx cycles than large caps are. Jill, awesome to catch up, as always. Jill Carey Hall and the team over at B of A pushing back against this rally over the last month. And as I say, they're not alone. Morgan Stanley alongside them, JP Morgan pushing back, no doubt. Marco Kalanovic and the team over at JP are going to publish a little bit later today. I look forward to reading that. Right now, about 12 minutes in, we're down a half of 1%. I said not much going on at the surface level. Beneath the surface, though, energy's getting hammered. We're down more than 4% on the S&P. And that's largely off the back of what's happening with crude this morning. I can tell you Brent and WTI getting hammered too. We're down by more than 5% on WTI to 87 on Brent down around about 5 percentage points on Brent to 93.20. I mentioned the data out of China, one. Bad. The data out of the U.S. this morning, Empire Manufacturing, too ugly. That's really when on commodities this morning, not just Brent and WTI, but also copper and some of the base metals, too. Coming up, we'll turn to politics in Washington. The former president in some hot water. No one is above the law. Donald Trump is not above the law, and Attorney General Garland is not above the law, either. And um, Congress has the powers of oversight. He needs to comply. A conversation. I'm next. No one is above the law. Donald Trump is not above the law, and Attorney General Garland is not above the law either. And um, Congress has the powers of oversight. He needs to comply. We've seen material like this before. We've seen materials that have been uh, submitted to courts for, uh, for warrants. This is not unprecedented. His actions are unprecedented. Bipartisan lawmakers pressuring the U.S. government for classified documents seized at Mar-a-Lago. The law is king. The president isn't king. And I would add to that, the former president isn't king. Everyone has to follow the laws. This is going to be up to the Justice Department um, to make a decision about what happened here. Bloomberg's AMH down in D.C. For more, Anne-Marie, this was the story in Washington over the weekend. Yeah, it certainly is, Jonathan. And Senator Klobuchar there also said in that interview that when she has had in the past to go look at these types of classified documents that are top secret, she even had to take her Fitbit off when she goes into these rooms called skiffs to look at these documents. So you see the politics following that raid really reverberating on both sides of the aisle. And what you have is both sides of the aisle asking for the contents of those documents. So you have Senator Warner, who's the chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, along with Vice Chair Marco Rubio, obviously a Republican and a Democrat, asking the DOJ and the Office of the National Intelligence Director for the contents of what was in these documents, 11 sets of classified material was taken from Mar-a-Lago, where the president has a residence, and also his resort in Palm Beach, Florida. The question really is, is 
if they find out the contents of that, what comes next? Because the Republicans, it, they really want to know the justification for going into the president's uh, private home and re uh, his residence. And for the Democrats, it's really about whether or not and how or how they could show that potentially national security was compromised by this action. Amory, on Friday going into the weekend, as hours bust after hour passed, we got a fuller picture of what actually happened and took place over the last few months or so. Things have gone quiet now. Amory, do you have a decent idea of the timeline for the week ahead and what we can expect? Well, many are pushing for, and we heard from Representative Brian, Brian Fitzpatrick over the weekend talking to CBS's Face the Nation. He was saying that we need to know the justification for this. He's a former FBI agent, so he's also telling his Republican colleagues to be careful for the words they use, because we have seen an uptick of rhetoric and what the FBI and the DOJ are telling their, their individuals uh, that work for them is that they are concerned about potential threats. Uh, there's a many in the Republican Party pushing for the affidavit so they can get more information behind really the why. But at the moment, Jonathan, a lot of this, there really is no timeline. It's wait and see, depending on what the Department of Justice and FBI do or say next. It's a big focus down in D.C. for the week ahead and beyond, that's for sure. AMH, down in Washington. Anne Marie, thank you. Our focus, of course, is on the economic data. We've got retail sales a little bit later this week, some Fed minutes as well. A little bit of peace and quiet from the Fed, just a little bit, because you will get some Fed speakers in the mix later this week. And then Mike McKee, into next week, it's Jackson Hole, Wyoming time. Yeah, we're all going to be out riding horses. Uh, is that what we're doing? Yeah. I wasn't told that. We've we got we to teach you to do that. Is that get, what I've signed up for? Get your Horse, cowboy horses in Jackson yeah. Hole. Or take a Jackson. miss. Can we talk about the data? <laughs> we can talk about the data, and it's going to be interesting this week because a lot of it is going to tell us things we already know. It's just a question of degree. On Tuesday, tomorrow, we have housing starts, and we know the Fed has affected housing with its higher interest rates. Industrial production, I would have said, probably wouldn't tell us that much, but after Empire Today, might be worth a look. Uh, retail sales is going to be the big one of the week. Everybody wants to know whether the consumer is still hanging in. Of course, that's influenced by the fact that uh, oil is a big part of it with gas station sales traded in dollars with prices of gasoline down. That could have a big impact. And the Fed minutes, this is one I don't think is going to be all that important. And the reason being, it was three weeks ago, and we've had that strong jobs report and weak inflation reports. Oh, uh, since then that would probably influence trading more. Jobless claims everybody keeps an eye on because maybe it's a canary in the coal mine. Philadelphia Fed takes on new importance because of empire. Uh, and then, as you mentioned, we have some uh, Fed speak, George Kashkari and Barkin. George, the only voter, so we'll see what she has to say. Uh, there is another aspect to next week, and that gets to the title there about what they say. We've got a lot of retail earnings. We're starting with the discounters, uh, Walmart uh, and TJX and Kohl's, plus Home Depot and Lowe's. Will they tell us the consumer is doing better or worse going forward? What's their outlook? We'll get the backward look from the retail sales figures, but what do they see happening with the consumer going forward, with their inventories going forward? And, of course, remember, Walmart sells gas, too. Yes, and gas is going to be a big feature of the numbers coming up on Wednesday and retail sales. Mike, for that reason, are we focused on the control group as opposed to the headline retail sales number? Yes, we get rid of cars, and we get rid of building material, and we get rid of gasoline. And that'll give you a, a core group that basically is kind of what goes into GDP. Crude right now getting hammered. The S&P 500 energy company is getting hammered too. Mike McKee, Sam Rowe asked this on Twitter. When did you last see in an official report on economic data the word plummet? It's been a while, hasn't it? It's been a while. Uh, we saw that. Uh, with the empire number today. We'll see if anybody else does that. The, the inflation numbers were a small drop. Uh, we're looking for a plummet in terms of uh, inflation. We're not looking for it in terms of production. Absolutely brutal. Crude down, energy equities down. Mike McKee, the data weak. Mike McKee, thank you. And yields down too on a 10-year by seven basis points to about 276. On a two-year by, let's call it, six basis points to about 318. I mentioned we're a bit defensive this morning, and you see that almost everywhere. The S&P down about a quarter of 1%. No drama at the headline number, but elsewhere, beneath the surface, a lot going on. Coming up, the market moving events you need to be watching. I'll run you through the trading diary from New York City. This is Bloomberg.
25 minutes into the session, no drama at the headline level. On the surface, we're down about a tenth of 1% on the S&P. The Nasdaq's now positive. The Russell struggling down eight tenths of 1%. But energy equities really lagging off the back of what is happening in crude right now. WTI and Brent down by somewhere between 4 and 5% off the back of some pretty dreadful data out of China and in the US too. That's the price action. Here's your trading diary. More data still to come. US housing starts coming up on Tuesday. Retail sales and Fed minutes on Wednesday, plus GDP out of the Eurozone. The Fed's Esther George and Neil Kashgari speaking on Thursday, following by existing home sales and another round of jobless claims. From New York City, good to be back in a seat. That does it for me. Thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. This was the countdown to the open for our audience worldwide. With equities doing just about OK, this is Bloomberg.